Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. In Vino Veritas, Part 2. I parked in the side lot of Pliny's Delights and walked through the very modern-looking entrance. I didn't remember it looking like that. Yesterday it had possessed a classic, charming look. The lighting was now much brighter, and the place looked sterile and cold. Not like the warm little shop I'd visited fewer than 24 hours previous. Guess I'd been pretty lit. An older man sat behind the counter. He wore a neutral expression, perhaps a little bored. Excuse me. I was in here yesterday and I spoke with a nice lady. Is she here today? I just need to ask about a very fine product she sold me. I didn't care about his response. I listened for what he really said. But all I got was what he intended to come out of his mouth. I'd learned to tell the difference. Sir, we are currently have no female employees. Perhaps you are in a different store or are mistaken about whom you met? I must have assumed a stupid expression as I stood back confused and looked around the store again. The cabinet. It was there, just as I recalled it. Only now it didn't reach the ceiling. And on top was a very old photo. It was black and white, well, yellowish with age and era of photography. But there was no doubt that was her. There, I said, and pointed at the ancient photo. That's her in the picture. Was that one of those old-timey photo setups? He briefly glanced over his shoulder and looked at me sourly. Sir, you are definitely mistaken. That is the owner's great-great-grandmother. The owner is elderly, so I'm sure the lady in the photo... The very authentic photo is long deceased. Now would you like to make a purchase or look at any of our products? I stood there, nonplussed, and tried to think. Something was definitely off about this place, about this man, and about what had happened just yesterday. So she sold me something from that old cabinet behind the counter, a great but very old vintage before I could get any further, he raised his hand and interrupted. Sir, there is nothing in that cabinet. It is an antique, purely for show. We don't even have a key for it anymore. Now, if you'd like older wines, we have a few in our top-shelf selection. I could tell he was impatient and really wanted me to buy something or leave. I didn't need that vino for that message to get through. I thanked him maybe apologized, some mumbled inane response. Perhaps the vino had worn off or no longer affected me. I rushed to my car in a panic and just took a small swig. I felt a little rush of energy, but nothing else. I knew how to fix things. It might lead to more nightmares and problems, but it was time to do or die. <laughs> Literally. As I drove, my memory strayed back to my youth. I had had a pretension of becoming a wise guy like my old man. I threw out his name and used his reputation rather than build one of my own. That was where the problem started. Eventually, I got crosswise with a man who didn't fear Papa Nick, much less one of his punk kids. Big Jim Elliot had his own criminal enterprise and his own staff. Papa Nick could have taken him. His organization was bigger and more established, but there was no need and wars were costly. Tell that to a 19-year-old trying to prove himself worthy of his father's attention. I made the fatal error of disparaging Big Jim in public, calling him small time and a wannabe. Dumbass that I was. These appellations applied more to me than to him. On some level, I must have craved a fight. I got it. In addition to shooting off my mouth, I was shooting pool at Lacey's Pub with some of my up-and-coming idiot friends. I was about to sink the eight ball and win another round. A cigarette dangled from my mouth. 
I tried to talk some smack as I prepared to shoot, like I was in some black-and-white gangster movie from the old days. Yeah, well, I say Big Jim is a lightweight, nothing without his crew of flying monkeys. That's when the lightweight and his flying monkeys made their presence known. A shadow loomed over the pool table. Did I mention that Big Jim was called Big for a reason? His goons backed down, my nascent crew with nothing more than a hard stares. So you have something to say about me and my crew? Try saying it to my face, sonny boy. He was definitely not taking this with a hint of grace or forgiveness in his heart. I glanced around and saw that my allies had turned instantly into quivering punks. They needed their leader to take a stand. Yeah, well, if you know. And that's as far as I got. <clears throat> I don't even remember the rest of the thrashing and stomping I got, and didn't feel it until I regained consciousness in the hospital. He'd knocked me cold and then given me a thumping I'd needed for my entire life to that point. Papa Nick stopped by the hospital to visit, and to ensure that I didn't finish digging my grave. You will publicly apologize to Big Jim. He pronounced it like a sentence, and that's what it felt like. Through the labored breathing I caused my cracked ribs and broken nose, I tried to object. But Papa, everyone knows he's just a fad. He has no staying power like us. We... He held up a hand. I'll stop you right there, Vinny. There is no us. We. If you want to follow in my footsteps, you'll have to prove yourself. You have no right to ride on my name. You'll have to do things that will wash away any notion that you are soft, weak, or a fool. Take actions that will instill fear in others so that they completely forgot what a punk you were today. Seems the vino worked on me even when I was talking to myself. I saw my next destination ahead, a building where a certain accountant worked. A real pencil neck. My blood began to boil, but I had to remain calm, composed. He had no idea that I knew. He'd assumed that I was drunk and had mistakenly stopped for a non-existent appointment. He worked out of an older building downtown. There was a camera on the main entrance, but none anywhere else. We weren't the only clients who used the back door and preferred anonymity. Gary was a whiz with tax code. We had regular accountants for day-to-day -day operations, but he kept us from federal, state, and local scrutiny. I timed it perfectly. His receptionist took off at 3 on Friday afternoons. It was 3.15 when I sauntered into his waiting room. I paused to listen at his office door. No conversations, so no witnesses. Just some pussy-ass pop satellite music he liked to listen to while he worked. I knocked on the door, way more loudly and forcefully than necessary. Hey, I was a drunken loser who couldn't keep hold of his wife, right? I opened the door and bobbed him with the edge as he approached from the other side to open it himself. Oh, sorry, Gary. That was really bad timing on my part, I said with a drunken slur. He backed away. His hand clutched to his left cheek and the red spot that grew and promised to become a shiner. I stepped closer to him, pretending concern. You gonna be okay, buddy? Wow, that was really a knock. It's okay, though. Makes you look tough, like a gladiator or something. One of those guys in that uh, Sparta Who's It show. He stood there, shaking in mortified anger. He wanted to lash out, but knew he couldn't. He spoke assuaging words of forgiveness. But this is what I heard. You drunken moron. If you'd stayed sober long enough to plow your idiot wife, then she'd stop bugging me. You're not only a limp dick. But you're clumsy. Why don't you go drive off a bridge or something? I smiled, satisfied that the vino still worked. Then I decked him. I draped his body over my shoulder and hefted him up the back stairs to the maintenance access door of the roof. I looked around for witnesses, but unless someone in the next closest building deliberately watched with a telescope, they wouldn't see anything unusual. 
I quickly carried him to the edge of the building that had an alley below. He started to regain consciousness, so I stood him on his feet at the ledge and slapped him the rest of the way awake. So, pencil neck, huh? You think I'm dickless? At least we agree that Francesca isn't much fun in the sack. I had the satisfaction of watching his eyes grow enormously wide and fill with fear. He stammered out what he intended to be placating words. No, wait, please. You psycho, you can't do this. Everybody knows I cuckolded you. You're a drunken fool. Please, people will notice I'm gone. They'll miss me. Why can't you just jump off the building and leave me be? I gave him my best wicked grin. I'm not driving off any bridges or jumping from any buildings. I find that I have something to live for. He gave me an owlish, questioning look, tinged with a hint of hope. I dashed it, just as the ensuing fall dashed his brains in the alley below. Unlikely anyone would find him until Monday trash pickup at the earliest. Very appropriate. Maybe his fellow rats would take care of some of the potential evidence. No one would believe a suicide, but there would be no suspects by that time. Anyone with a stake would have taken care of one way or another. It was time to go to the last place Papa Nick would suspect. It wasn't easy to get in, but I still had keys and codes to everything from the last time I'd had to earn my keep the hard way for dear old dad. I knew that except for the cleaning staff and the goon on guard, no one would be at his home. His real wife would be at yoga. It was getting late. He'd be leaving the office soon and headed home to where he did his true work where he talked without reservations about his criminal enterprises, his sanctum sanctorum. I made it into the residence. Servants' entrance are awesome and usually forgotten, especially these days when few people had regular servants, just contractors. Of course, when one had to keep crucial secrets, he tended to hire people and ensure that they had a vested interest and keeping their mouths shut. It looked like the cooking and cleaning staff were gone for the day. I eased past the media room where a hulking figure sprawled, watching some sports show. The on-duty security, almost there, and Excelsior, the office. I rifled the Circus Maximus-sized desk and found what I wanted for supplies. I used the restroom and then took up my hunting stand in what would have been the closet if this had been used as a bedroom. Hunting stand. I laughed internally. Like I'd ever hunted mere animals. I liked animals and I didn't need to prove anything. <laughs> Plus, who wanted to go into the woods? The time I'd spent in them had been invariably unpleasant. I settled into a box and leaned back against the wall. I dozed off with thoughts of my first trip to the woods. <laughs> but the hunt had already been completed before we arrived. I was not in the woods. I was in a car. Frank Sr. sat beside me. He was my handler and coach, this first return to glory mission. And I was nervous, naturally. I participated in getting some people back on track with a little rough stuff, but this was next level. I was in college. I should have been home writing papers or something. Instead, I was in this beater car with a souped-up engine, sitting beside Frank Sr. with his garlic breath, waiting on a certain business associate of Dad's to leave his favorite side piece's apartment. The memory was just like then, but I drifted out of my body and saw from above as the thirtyish man in an expensive but rumpled suit walked out of the building. I heard Frank Sr. say, that's him. I didn't feel the nudge, but my younger body did, and both of us left the vehicle and walked towards the man. Frank Sr. kept an eye out in all directions, 
but my body was laser-focused on the intended target. As we drew near, the man, about to put the key into the lock of his car, paused and looked up startled. So much for the afterglow of lovemaking, I thought to my dream self. Then my body raised a little revolver and put it to the man's eye. I heard a faint pop as the small caliber pistol fired and the man collapsed, quite thoroughly and very convincingly dead. The dream flashed forward to Frank Sr. pulling me by the arm to get me going of his calming words as we dragged the body quickly over to the theater and then drove out to the disposal site. Ah. This is why I dreamed of woods, a big state park handy for hiding bodies. Flash forward again to this very room, to Papa Nick praising me for paying the bills. No, I hadn't fixed the problem yet, but I was on my way. I still needed to rehabilitate my reputation, and I still owed him. I wakened to hear the door to the room close and voices speak. Papa Nick and, yes, the Franks. I don't really care about the updates and excuses. I have decreed him dead, and that needs to happen quickly. Frank Jr. responded, Yes, sir, I'll go find him myself and take care of it. He reversed course and bustled back out of the room. After the door closed, Frank Sr. chuckled, He's a good kid, Nick. Cut him some slack. Your boy was acting weird today, more so than usual. No idea where the guys lost him, but maybe he ain't as far gone as we were thinking. Nick fluttered his hand. He's gone to me, bastardo, always needy, that one. Always wanting notice and affection. I gave him everything anyone could want in life, yet he kept failing. No good at business at all had to keep doing contracts to repay me. Oh, don't get me wrong, that was useful. He eliminated a fair number of problem people for us. Had real talent for that, but no stomach. He sat behind the colossal mahogany desk and steepled his fingers. Maybe I should have brought him on the crew instead of letting him flail away at the business world, for which he had and still has no ability he certainly showed more talent for slaughter than he did for anything else. Frank Sr. took the seat to the right of his boss and handed him one of the two drinks he'd prepared. Yeah, he has talent, but he took it to heart and let the world turn him into a monster. Monsters are careless. What he became made him weak in a wrong ways, made him vulnerable to the bottle. You did the only thing you could have, he assured my father. Nick nodded. All but let him take out Big Jim. Some other outfit did that. Vinny was right about it, too. Big Jim was a punk. His sucker punched my boy, and the boy's big mistake was picking a pussy crew. Started him down the wrong road. He never gained any real self-respect. He sighed with finality. Ah, oh, well water under the bridge, soon to be a body in the river. He grinned and raised his glass in salute to his closest friend and his soon-to-be-dead son. I sat and listened and wondered if I was hearing the unvarnished truth. I'd slept and hadn't had a new dose of vino, yet these two were old friends. No doubt they were speaking as honestly as either ever did. For all I knew, they were talking about something else, and I was merely heard the truth. In any case, my father, whose approval was all that I'd craved in youth, and his best friend, who I had wanted desperately to see as an uncle, a mentor, a centurion to hone my skills, had just agreed that I was a write-off. I had to stifle a laugh. Write-off. Remind me of Gary, the tax man, as I faced him forward for his plunge and gave him just a little bit of wedgie before I released him into the air. That meant that I wasn't wearing the stern and righteous anger countenance I'd intended when I stepped from the closet. I didn't burst out all fury and mayhem as I'd planned, but wearing a grin. Wouldn't have mattered, 
The room was soundproof, and dear old Dad's large-caliber pistol was equipped with a silencer. Yet the drama became all business when I walked into the office room. First I shot Frank Sr. in the head, once for fun and once to be done, the way he himself had taught me, though the larger caliber made a mess of things. Papa Nick whipped open his top drawer and dug for the pistol that currently filled my own hand. I waved it in a side-to-side -side gesture that mimicked a shaking head. He reached down to retrieve the little derringer he kept on his ankle. I stepped around the side of the desk and stomped on that ankle. He barked out a high-pitched cry of agony, then slumped out of the chair and curled himself on the floor, all while clutching at his wound. Come on, father. We must show some dignity, some style, some gravitas. The lessons you ground into me must keep up appearances, best practices and all. He stammered with pain, with age, with an already diseased and damaged heart. Vinny, please, we can talk. Why are you doing this? I favored him with my most sincere smile. Oh, you talked, and I heard. Not what you said, but what you really had in mind. Now you and Frank just confirmed what I suspected. You meant to have me killed. For what? You think I'm an embarrassment? I started drinking because of the nightmares. Because of what you drove me to do. The bodies... I've taken out and stacked in unmarked graves under the pines for you. Then I started drinking more. My grin turned savage. Guess my piece of shit half-sister hasn't caught on yet. You have plenty of cause to have me eliminated. I've been robbing the company blind for a few years. Just thought you should know before you die. I've been terribly stressed. I slipped into the bottles all unawares. But I am completely sober and enjoying this moment. At that point, I was startled by a knock at the door. It's me, Frank Jr., sir. The brown-nosing piece of weasel shit, I chuckled. This was getting better by the minute. I placed the barrel of the pistol to my lips to shush Nick, who looked hopeful at the portal. I saw the look and shook my head in mock pity. Not gonna help you. I yanked open the door and grabbed the thug by the front of the shirt and hit him with the barrel of the pistol, then pulled him inside and shut the door behind him. He stumbled forward but stayed on his feet. He scrambled for his own pistol but stopped when he saw his father's body with the extruding brains stretched in front of the desk. He knelt beside the still warm corpse and grabbed his hand. I like to think that just before I fired the round into the back of his skull, that he felt immense grief, immense loss, and failure. Stop, I ordered before I even turned back towards Papa Nick. He tried to sneak over to the door while I savored my triumph. He started and hunched his shoulders at first. I thought it was in resignation, but, oh, this night kept getting better. I made my escape into the darkness. The bodyguard was still watching television and now had a pair of companions, presumably Frank Jr.'s team. No point in taking out the trash. I'd used Papa's phone to call in an emergency and just left the line open. Would love to see their faces when the police arrived. Francesca, the harpy, fled before me when I arrived at my home. She didn't want to chatter anymore. I didn't give her a choice. Freshly fortified by the vino, I cornered her in our bedroom, my bedroom, and I heard, Vinny, I'm truly scared. The kids and I just want to be free. Oh, I'm so scared. Please don't kill me. I loved you once, but you got so cold, and then the drinking started. Then the screw-ups at work. Please don't kill me. Please don't hurt the kids. Not them. Never them. No. After a while, I couldn't tell. What she said from what I'd heard, it was the same babble to which I'd grown accustomed. I can't believe that I ever loved this, this thing. She now disgusted me, used up, frightened, 
feeling genuine terror at my approach. That's what I'm sure approached to her, like a stone-faced enforcer. In wine there is truth, and in fear there is as well. I didn't hurt her, just told her to leave and that I didn't need to kill her. She was already dead to me. I even let her pack a few things. She, of course, hadn't taken me seriously last night. Dante emerged from his room, headphones dangling and that vapid look on his face from when he'd been immersed in his video game fantasy worlds for too long. Can you, like, get your shit too, pal? I'm sure your mother will need a ride. Oh, and Francesca, you will need to take numbnuts here for a DNA test. I don't think he's mine. Within six months, I cleaned up my world. I didn't keep the money I'd embezzled from the company. I used it to trap my hosebag half-sister. I really hadn't meant to become an alky. At first, it was just a way to numb my conscience. And then it was a show, a farce that became reality. I patted the old bottle with the exquisite velvet cover. It was nearly empty. I'd used it often and to great effect. And the corporation, under the guidance of my half-brother, one of the legitimate heirs, had bought out my shares at a considerable profit in my favor. For some reason, he was intimidated by me. Pliny's delight was open. The lights inside the classic storefront twinkled and beckoned, and all appeared as it had on that first visit, the one where I was so hammered out of my skull. There were several cars in the lot, and it looked and sounded like there was a party inside. When I made my way through the front door, there she was again, that lovely lady, no mere photograph, but here and alive. Welcome back, Vincent. I see that you've enjoyed the Veritas Est in Sangrium vintage. I trust that you have found that the truth you sought. I just finished off the vino, and I understood the true question. Yes, I know who I am and what I am. I come from a long line of hard men who did hard things. I tried to be something else for the sake of my wife, my family. In the end, it was my family with the capital F that stirred my blood. She smiled. No doubt she'd received many such confessions, heard the realizations. She gestured with those lovely hands and smiled that enticing smile and drew me towards the cabinet to try a new vintage. Pleurus, Caprula, Quam, Gladius. More die from drunkenness than sword. War. <laughs> so quoth this raven. My dears, <laughs> I am still not back on schedule, obviously. But, um, hopefully, hopefully soon, things will be back to normal. Um, don't leave, I promise. I'll, I'll get through this and things will not be as busy. Anyway, I hope you all have a perfectly lovely day, my darlings. Thank you so kindly for stopping by my chateau, my darlings. It does mean so much to me. Please, if you have not subscribed, as many of you have not, please do so. Give me a like so I know what you would like to hear. And comment. I always love to read your comments. And special thanks to my Patreon and membership supporters. Ciao, darlings. <laughs>